I just quickly Googled, what's the most amount of money for the least amount of schooling that I could do to just change everything? And it was cardiac technician, which is what popped up. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna become a cardiac technician. You know, it's only two years of school and apparently we need a lot of them. And so I went back to school. I took calculus, which is so out of my wheelhouse and chemistry. Basically the one hour of homework a night turned into about six hours of homework for me because I just like, it's out. I don't know what I'm doing. So I'd spend six hours a night in the library every single night. I passed both courses with a B, thank you very much. But then I just decided that like, Yo, this is not for me. I just don't know it. But I was at a moment where I just sort of like threw myself down on the ground and said, okay, what then? Like, what am I supposed to be or do? Like, I don't feel like anything I do connects or is easy or feels like I'm in the flow of life. And so I said, screw it. I'm gonna start making dips. Well, hi there and welcome. I'm Joan Posse, host of the Side Hustle Hero podcast, the show that is laser focused to inspire you to start or to scale your side hustle income streams. Not only did today's guest start making dips, but she took the $500 that she had from selling a painting and started her side hustle selling those dips. Not being able to afford a car, she began making her deliveries by bicycle and even public transit. Through a lot of hard work, tenacity, and a passion for good food, Today's guest, Melissa Mills, now has her dips in over 2,000 stores, operates out of a 20,000 square foot facility with revenues of over $3 million. You'll hear honest conversation about what it took to grow the company and what she sees as critical mistakes made by aspiring entrepreneurs. You'll learn from her stories of times when things didn't go as planned and her experience of dealing with the three tiers of grocery store ecosystems you can get into and why striving to get your product into the big chain stores may not always be your wisest move. She'll tell you about a preferred sweet spot. Be sure to catch the end of episode takeaway for inspiration to do the tough stuff you know needs to be done for your side hustle. But before all that, I have a favor to ask. If you're enjoying what you're hearing in this podcast, I'd be so grateful if you would take a moment and leave a five-star review at the platform where you're listening to let others know that there's valuable content here to help them start or grow their side hustle. Thank you so much. Now here is my conversation with the founder and CEO of Spreadum, Melissa Mills. Well, welcome, Melissa. Thank you, nice to be here. I've got to tell you, I eat pretty much everything. I eat a ton of vegetables and I love a good charcuterie board with meats and cheeses. So when I met your husband, Luke, at the local farmer's market, I wasn't looking for a dairy substitute. I just appreciate quality food, which is why I was at the farmer's market in the first place. I like to buy as much as I can from local producers, and Luke was handing out free samples. Well, I tried one of the creamy cashew dips. To me, it looked like cream cheese, and that was it. It was it was love at first bite. Is that your top seller? Is that your flagship product? Yeah, the creamy cashew dips for sure is what started the company. Well, it was more of the beet dip. And then we kind of moved into culturing the cashew sort of cream mm-hmm. to give it that tangy zing. And then we just started sort of playing on, playing on that. Yeah. Well, what really got me intrigued, Melissa, was when I learned that it all started as a side hustle with $500 and a cargo bike, which I'm going to ask you to explain to us. Well, well, tell us about that journey. Yeah, sure. It was kind of funny. I... I've never really known what I was going to be or do with my life. And I've always kind of curved more towards the artistic things. I thought I was going to be a super famous musician in a band (laughs) for most of my life. And then I got into painting and I had a short stint at Emily Carr. And I thought I would pursue that a little bit more. But all along, my entire life has sort of been a side hustle. As an artist, you're kind of used to having your heart set in one place and, and sort of making money in another. So it was not... I was very much used to that sort of a lifestyle. And then just one day I just decided that I couldn't be an artist anymore because I was around 30, I think at the time. And we all know living in Vancouver is quite expensive. Yes. To your point, I did not own a car still at 30 years old. I don't know if I'd ever owned a car. I was renting a bedroom, like as often, you know, young adults do, they share with friends. But like, as you're starting to move more into like, late adulthood, like sharing of the, yeah. sharing of the, you know, renting a room is not as, 
it's not what you hoped and dreamed of as a no. child. Anyway, me, I always thought I'd have my own apartment. I could decorate it however I wanted. For you know, sure. those were dreams I wanted. <laughs> and so I was starting to really put a lot of pressure on myself to be like, okay, I think we have to flip the switch here and turn the arts into the side hustle and find something that was suitable. So hilarious story. Anyone who knows me knows that this is a terrible fit. But anyway, I just quickly Googled What's the most amount of money for the least amount of schooling that I could do to just change everything? Because I'm also, um, my personality type is very like efficient and maximum. Like I cook on maximum. I drive on maximum. I'm very much a straight line person. I, I One cool thing though about this company has helped me try to enjoy the journey kind mm. of of life, which mm-hmm. is kind of interesting, but we can talk about that later. But yeah. So at that point, it's like, I want to make mega bucks right away. Yeah, exactly. Or something, at least to pay my rent and maybe get a car one day. It was sort of like, you know, my I, own I place. sort of low. Yeah, exactly. And it was cardiac technician, which is what popped up. And I was like, <laughs> okay, I'm going to become a cardiac technician. You know, it's only two years of school. And apparently we need a lot of them. And with the heart disease being like, the oh, number one thing, it makes sense. So I went back to school. I took calculus, which is so out of my wheelhouse and chemistry because I had to upgrade. Basically the one hour of homework a night turned into about six hours of homework for me because I just like, it's out. I don't know what I'm doing. So I'd spend six hours a night in the library every single night. I passed both courses with a B. Thank you very much. But then I just decided that like, yo, this is not for me. I just don't know. And I was kind of at an end where, you know, like odd times in your life, like I don't necessarily believe in God or any sort of sources outside of my own ability to do things. But I was at a moment where I just sort of like threw myself down on the ground and said, (laughs) okay, what then? Like, what am I supposed to be or do? Like, I don't feel like anything I do connects or is easy or feels like I'm in the flow of life. And so I said, screw it. I'm going to start making dips because I have always been very passionate about whole foods, making good food out of very simple ingredients. Mm -hmm. I've always had a sort of a a knack for flavors and combinations and things. And people love my dips. And I noticed that the dip cat as a dip lover, the dip category is really starting to go downhill fast. It used to be good. It used to make me feel good when I eat it because, you know, girl dinners, some crackers, some dips, you know, hanging out, uh, some veggies or whichever. And I just noticed they started making my tummy hurt. And so I thought, okay, I'll sell these at the farmer's market. I'd never even really been to a farmer's market because I couldn't even really afford to shop at a farmer's market in the past. Maybe as a, an event, you know, you go buy an apple and some thing of strawberries, but not like as a shopper, even though I was very interested in the local food movement. And it just sort of exploded because people had never seen a bright pink dip, like the beet dip before there was no beet dips Uh, when I started making the beet dip here in Canada. And then we had a few other kind of a pesto one and an onion one. And I love dips. Like, I love them. (laughs) (laughs) So I didn't want to do anything else. I just love how funny combinations are so endless. You know, you got, it's all wholesome stuff. And who doesn't like, I was doing some research recently on dips and why people love dips so much. And it's truly because it makes our food just tastes better, right? Like not a lot of us are good at cooking or, you know, we just kind of cook it and then what? Right. So the dips yeah. just kind of helps things go down and it kind of makes things fun. It really makes it pop. Well, when you went from artist to cardiac technician, to <laughs> me that sounds, sounds so bizarre. But now when you're talking about crafting recipes and working on it in the kitchen, I can kind of see that technician side of you. Yeah, I guess so. It's kind of interesting because people, my friends often call me like a mad scientist or even sometimes a savant in certain ways that I am so creative and I'm kind of messy, but I'm also highly organized. I'm like the polar opposites of every single attribute there is in one person. And it's very unusual, people say. And so, yes, I guess... In terms of cooking, it is a science, truly. Combining flavors is a science. Mm -hmm. Balancing flavors even more so with, you know, there was a pretty famous Netflix documentary on salt, fat, and sugar, and heat, and those basic elements. So I was kind of doing all those things without even knowing I knew what I was sort of doing. So it was kind of fun to kind of see where I could thrive. And it was really exciting for me as a person just because... I'd always have kind of like that ugly duckling syndrome where I never ever quite felt like I fit in. Like I'm always just like jobs I've had or the things I was doing or where I was in my life always Mm -hmm. kind of felt like I was there, but I wasn't like experiencing life the way I should be in a sense. Yeah. 
And so then when the dip thing happened or this company happened, it sort of combined everything that I loved in one. I really like design and graphic design and those sorts of things. So that kind of fit in the packaging realm. I could really see through that creative side. It really was my sort of mission and values and the thing I wanted to contribute in the world could come through and how we source our products or our ingredients, sorry, how we treat employees or, you know, just big picture elements yes. come through in that sense. And then yeah. also the real curious technical side of me, you know, even when I was painting, I wasn't just painting landscapes, you know, I put a lot of effort into, I'm really interested and have been for, you know, since I was 11 or 12 years old in consciousness and mindfulness mm -hmm. and sort of the nature versus nurture element of humanity. And so I was able to also combine that deep curiosity for humanity food, learning things. Yeah, the company becomes an outlet for all these different aspects of you. And uh, mm -hmm. do you have some nice artwork that you've done around the company now? I had a little art show just before I sort of started spread them. And I think I was just selling them at Banditas. They let, there was a, like a Mexican place and they'd let artists cut the hang stuff there for a month and people could buy it. Yes. And just before that, I had sold almost all of my pieces except for, I think two, the one I have now and another one. And just before I started spread them, someone just randomly out of the blue emailed me and said, hey, do you happen to have any more of those paintings? Wow. And so there I made another $500 to kind of help towards this new venture. Right. Uh, and it just kind of all felt perfect at the time. This uh, unexpected funding came through for you. Yeah, right? At this point, you're selling the predominantly the beet dips and a couple of others. Mm -hmm. And then what happens from there? From there, I was just, delighted and elated every single day for the first time in my life for a very long time <laughs> where I just really loved being in the moment. I wasn't thinking about the future or dwelling on my shortcomings or how come I'm not successful and all these things. I was truly just having fun, having fun. It was flying off the shelves. Like literally I wasn't even in stores necessarily yet. And people mm -hmm. were calling me to meet me in Starbucks parking lot saying like, I need 20 of these. And I'd literally go there and, and bring them and they'd give me the money. And it kind of felt like a drug <laughs> deal in a sense of like, that was happening all the time. And people were wow. literally emotional about it. Like, I'm scared. I won't see you again. And this stuff has changed my life. Like either I have a lot of allergies, I can't enjoy food, really normal stuff. Or at the time too, when we first started, there wasn't this explosion of gluten-free and yeah. vegan and all this sort of restrictive eating thing. So we were really hitting the spot for so many people where they felt like for this sort of section of people, yeah. they felt like they could just be normal just enjoy food for the sake of enjoying food, which becomes a real thing when you like when you have end up having a problem with allergies or food sensitivities, like you can be in a lot of pain for a really long period of time and it can mm -hmm. cause a lot of problems. And to be able to, I don't know, to give people that element of sort of humanity and joy back. And then also to be knowing that everything we make is truly really good. And it tastes mm -hmm. like it's naughty for you or whatever that, yeah. you know, thing is, but it's the closest thing to all whole food ingredients. And people are so surprised too. They're like, how do you get these ingredients to taste so good? Like right. I tried recreating your dips at home because you no. know they're 10 bucks <laughs> and like literally can't. I've even had chefs in Vancouver say this to me or professional recipe developers literally saying like, I want you to know, I really tried to recreate this. I'm sorry about that, but I need to come clean in the fact that I just can't like the, however you're doing it. Right. Is that a um, corporate secret? I guess so in the sense yeah. that it's just me, I guess. I'm the corporate secret, I suppose. I do have one of those like a super taster tongue where I can taste bitter elements and sort of things that not everyone can sort of taste. So I know how to balance that stuff. But I would just say that I guess it's because also my intention for what I'm doing truly is like I just want to do good and I just want to have fun and I just want to contribute to something and because that is me and that is how everything about what we do goes through that lens first mm -hmm. it's really easy to make good tasting food or ethical food or environmental choices or supporting other things because that's just that's just me yeah so i guess a, a tip for people who are starting a side hustle and want to grow it is like really spend a lot of time 
figuring out who you are and not just your strengths, like, you know, maybe you're good with numbers or maybe you're friendly. And so you can do sales, but truly like if money were no object and if you could be spending your time doing anything, what would it look like? Would you be surrounded by lots of people? Would you just be yourself mostly? Or, you know, and looking at those things, I think because I know myself so well, Yes. because as an artist, I spent a lot of time alone. You just kind of, it can then blossom at some mm-hmm. point and, and then it kind of comes on very naturally, I suppose. So at this point with the farmer's market, you have fans, you have stalkers apparently. And uh, <laughs> at this point, continue to experiment and bring in the cashew dip line. Yeah, that's right. And so after the first year, we st- I, st- I obviously needed new products. And so I started this because back in the day, too, I was really interested in raw food. And they'd always had cashew cheese and those sorts of things in that, you know, it's it's not a new thing per se. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, oh, that's something that no one's really doing. And creamy dips, like who doesn't like creamy dip, but you don't exactly. always want mayo or like, you know, the oils and all these things. And so, yeah, mm-hmm. I started experimenting with that. In the beginning, we just used a um, sauerkraut brine from a local sauerkraut lady we met at the farmer's market. So we had a little bit of a collaboration going on there. We've moved, since moved away from that sort of style. But, and then we just started getting into stores because again, people were like, okay, how can I find you again? Like, I need to know yes. that there's going to be some sort of consistency in availability. And so, yeah, I biked around to five stores that were kind of within my neighborhood or whatever. Were these places buying them wholesale or were you putting them in there on consignment? No, it was definitely wholesale. I'd never okay. entertained consignment. I always spent, knew they would sell. Okay. And if they didn't, I would just do a demo or whichever to get people tasting them just because I'd had such good success at the farmer's market. Yeah. We literally could have turned the farmer's market into a very well-paying full-time gig for myself. I just wanted to do that forever, which I thought I did. I okay. mean, we still do the farmer's markets. They're great for all kinds of reasons, but mostly the feeling you get from being at the farmer's market, the vendors and the people and the appreciation of just getting it. Yes. Is just something that you need when you start to grow your company. I think I was going to ask you about that because of the success of your company. I was surprised that you're still at the farmer's markets, but then I would imagine that that's also beneficial from a research standpoint and talking to customers one-on-one. Yeah. Yeah. Research for sure. Testing new flavors, but truly just actually getting people, mostly we do it for selfish reasons. It's not necessarily for the money aspect as much as it is for the appreciation that Mm -hmm. you get from being there. It just fills you up so much that you can then go out and brave the other stuff that happens, whether it's a machine that breaks down or whether it's, you know, trying to move into a new facility and trying to balance all the costs and people calling in sick or people leaving a bad review because they don't know, you don't know what you put into it or, you know, just all those things that really start weighing you down where you're like, why do I do this again? Nobody appreciates me. <laughs> and then you go to the farmer's market, you're like, oh, yes, they do. Okay, I can do this. Do you do some of the markets yourself? Yeah, I do sometimes. I don't get to do them as much, but Luke always fills me in on all the stories. I, I force him to give me a play-by-play of every single interaction. <laughs> well, back in those days, you were doing markets one or two days a week? Oh, yeah, maybe three. Maybe three, okay. And so you said that you were happy to do that the rest of your life. What made that shift to say, okay, we can really scale this now? I think still it was just people. I didn't even think about scaling. And plus, I'll just note that like, I didn't know how to do any of this, like literally just Googled and took courses as I went, like I got QuickBooks or whichever. And then I actually literally went to Langara College and did a course on QuickBooks. Like I wanted to know, because I'm such a thorough, that's one of my, like, what do you call it? Like. It's a pro and a con. Yes, where yeah. I, a blessing I, and a curse. Yes, a blessing yeah. and a curse in <laughs> that like, I don't know if it's also just my learning style, but I'm not very good at learning surface because I don't have the greatest memory unless I actually know why I will not retain it. I don't mm. know why this has plagued me since elementary school days. And so, yeah, I went and did a course at Langara for this QuickBooks thing and, and just all the things that we do. And then we just kind of like moved into a commissary and then people kept on driving. Okay. Could you get into Whole Foods? Could you get into this place? I was like, okay. Feedback. It seems like that was propelling you along because my understanding is that it's one thing you can sell product food 
that you've made out of your kitchen at a farmer's market. But when you step into retail, you can't do that anymore, right? So you had to find an external commercial kitchen. Yeah, exactly. So it was also very interesting because of how things were lining up because normally you can't make dips at home either, but I also couldn't afford a, a commissary kitchen at the time of I started the, the, this company. Um, but it just so happened it was the Vancouver Coastal Health guy. It was his last year. And because our stuff was fermented and the pH was so low, it was sort of in a gray area where it kind of fit into the category that can be made at home. But because oh. it was had a fresh element, it was also maybe couldn't be made at home. Okay. So they like came and inspected our house and how I would do it or whichever. And he said, you know what? I can let you do that. And honestly, this company would not have started had I needed to get a commissary in the beginning. Because I literally right. had, when I say I had $500, like that's truly all that I had to start this company. Maybe define a commissary kitchen for us. Yeah. So it's a shared kitchen space. You generally get maybe a table and a shelf and a very small portion of it, maybe a refrigerated spot if you need it. And you can go, it's open kind of 24 hours or, you know, early into late or whichever. And it sort of becomes your own little factory, mm -hmm. which I really love the commissary life because you do are around a lot of other people sort of doing the same thing. So you right. can learn a lot from each other, share suppliers or share you know ch chat about difficult stuff or share wins and it was actually a really nice. beautiful community I would say also for me was another growth because as an artist or I'm actually even though I am very friendly and people always think that I'm an extrovert I, I am like a loner through and through and have been since a very young age I maybe had one friend in and out of one friend only and I spent so much time alone that it was kind of was good for me to get into a space where it was easy to sort of be around people because I'm not the type of yeah. person that would seek that sort of thing out. And you just learn so much. And it was actually really great. People going through similar struggles and challenges. Absolutely. Yeah. And it was so great to be able to share or even hands, you know, like to be like, I need help loading this truck. <laughs> like somebody <laughs> help me. And then somebody would come or, hey, I'm not going to be there and I'm getting a delivery. Would you, could you make sure that it's received and it's put in the cooler or that they gave me the right amount of stuff? And, you know, you just have that extra support without having to pay an employee. And it's all people who get it too, because they'd be like, mm -hmm. oh, could you do that for me? And they just are very, very supportive. And commissaries in Vancouver are particularly expensive, like very, very expensive. And so how much do they rent for per hour or per month? You probably do it by how do, how do they work? Back in the day, I don't I'm, I'm sure they've gone up quite a lot. But I think it was a couple thousand dollars. Like, you know, it's a lot. Wow. It's yeah. not a little. So if you're selling $6 dips or $10 dips, yeah. you know, you think about how many you have to sell to have a commissary. It's not accessible. I wouldn't yeah. say it's not it's not really easy. To your point about so when you started with the 500 in the farmer's market that allowed you to test your recipes the procedures the demand you finally get into some stores you've got enough revenue coming in then that you can justify being in the commissary yeah exactly and so in these early days by now you've got quickbooks right yeah <laughs> and i'm thinking of this question for the benefit of people starting out in those first couple of years what profit margin were you needing to maintain in order to feel that it was it was even worthwhile that there was enough profit there to grow the company or was that yes. even a consideration at that point to be honest I, I didn't i don't like when i see numbers i make this joke they look like shapes i don't <laughs> focus on the numbers at all i mean i can't do math of course that's a funny joke i say to myself but i never put math like i never put numbers first i always put people and quality first mm -hmm. and figure out how to make it work. So I was actually just lucky in the sense that my margins were really great. I was also, when I first started buying things from like no frills and Costco. And so that's probably the most expensive those ingredients are ever going to be. And yes. so then as you scale, you kind of build in the profit margin because you're going to pay less for certain ingredients and packaging as you can start to buy in volume. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be that much more volume when you start buying at like grocery stores for your ingredients or, or things like that. So yeah. I'd say there, but I would say that what I've learned now is that a very healthy profit margin is probably around, and it has to be margin, not markup. Make sure you find a, a margin calculator and not a markup calculator because it is slightly different. And probably like, you know, 50 
55 or 60%, depending on the vision of your company, specifically in packaged goods. If you want to move into natural chains, you're going to have to allocate a percentage, 30% markup that margin that they're going to put on your product going out. So you right. might lose that. And then distribution is going to be another 26 to 30 five percent say uh, and then you'll have your direct accounts then where you know you're maintaining that and some people just decide to go straight to Costco's or club but those are people typically who have outside money and who maybe proven their concept and then either went and got investors or have family money that they can then set up a proper factory to then support the um you know the products going out the door at those volumes yeah, in, but, in, in the case of something like costco that first order is going to be huge and require big bucks right yeah exactly for inventory and such and also you got to know somebody who understands costco and truly understands how it all works because people always think oh if i get a costco account you know everything's solved but then if it doesn't sell then they would take that off of you know your initial PO or whichever. So you could end up making nothing truly. Right. Uh, it really does matter. So you have to do your research. And I do think if you are getting into packaged goods, it's important that you do start somewhat small and you, people always want to like go really fast and get in all the places. But the cool thing about what we did is that I grew the business as the demand grew and really focused on, you know, five or six stores a year and just really paid them a great deal of attention, whether that be through demos and just thoughtful community events nearby and sharing it and getting the word out because we grew it that way kind of slowly within our means. We've never gotten outside investment. We just used the profits of the company to grow. And we stayed in that commissary for a very long time. I think we made a million, our first million dollars and we were still in a commissary. Wow. It sounds like it wasn't a matter of setting these goals or expectations saying this is how quickly I want to grow it but rather it was more being pushed by the marketplace and your clientele yeah exactly and because I never I never had the expectation of needing to be a hundred million dollar company to be that to have, find my worth as a human being or to be a hundred million dollars because then once I have all this money I can do what I really want to do right I was really having fun or am still really having, even when it's really difficult and I can't sleep at night or there's a problem to solve that feels so outside of my capacity, I just spend some time thinking about it. And I generally always come up with the right answer. Can you think of one of those things that kept you up at night that you were able to work through? So many things. I mean, <laughs> Where do I start? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess we have a pretty, I would say for the amount of volume we pump out, we have a very small amount of production staff. I think we have between six and 12 people at any given time or so. And we're able to do a lot with a little. And in 2022, I had this idea that we should maybe double our staff to prepare for larger volumes of things and to make it a little easier on people. And, you know, I don't know, I'm always thinking how to make things easier. And that wasn't necessarily the greatest idea because first of all, it costs a lot. Wages are for sure our number one expense. Yes. And then on top of it, once you get over, I think it's half a million dollars in payroll expenses, you have to pay extra taxes on that. And there's lots of other things that you just don't think about when you're doing something like that. And so we spent a lot of money for basically no extra volume of stuff. And I guess it kind of kept me up at night because I was trying to figure out, well, how do you grow, I suppose? Like, how do you balance the people that you need to do the job with if someone calls in sick and or is needs to go away for a month or two back to wherever they want to go, visit yeah. family and then come back? Because we do also try to not be such a strict workplace. You know, we do try to be flexible for people. Yeah. And so I guess, you know, just staying up at night trying to figure out how you balance all of this stuff when you also are funded only by your own profits. Right. And then sometimes making mistakes with money and it not working out or getting the ROI. And that I think all the stresses that have ever really kept me up have definitely been around funding mm -hmm. and 
am I making the right choice? Should I get investors or should I just keep trucking uh, on the way that we're doing things? Am I doing it right? You know, questioning that all the time is stuff that kind of Mm -hmm. creeps up on you when at 3 a.m. suddenly you're like subconscious. Why? No, I don't want to talk about this right now. (laughs) No, no, we can talk about this when we get into the office. I need my sleep now. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, how did you break through into Whole Foods. And I should mention for those listening outside of North America, that's a big deal. They're a major grocery store chain. Yeah. Whole Foods was actually not that easy, not that hard for us. In they that, knew a good thing when they saw it. Yeah. The criteria, I mean, dips are a pretty important category in the sort of fresh section. There should, people buy a lot of dips. Most people who do like dips buy between three and five dips per shop. A lot of people buy at least one you know, a month, almost every household. And so dips are a pretty big velocity driver in the grocery store. And there hadn't been a lot of innovation there for a pretty long time. You know, you've got hummus, you got hummus toppings, then you have basically it, you know, just different kind of cultural plays off hummus and flavorings and things like that, but nothing had really been done. And so for the whole foods, our ingredients are so, so clean, the cleanest of the clean, that it almost made perfect sense. Now, also the fact that I also worked at Whole Foods on Hamby when they first opened up in the produce department. So I did kind of know a few people nice. there and it kind of helped because, every, you know, if you worked at Whole Foods, your Whole Foods alumni tend to be well supported, I would say. Yeah. So that first order with them, was it for the one store then? No, it was for all the ones in Western BC or Western Canada. So I think it's just in BC. I think there's maybe six or seven stores, six or seven stores, whichever. And then once we got into distribution, then we um, got to go into the ones in Ontario. But I'd say for the first three or four years, we were only in the BC ones. And when I first started delivering, I mean, they changed the rules a lot since then because it was bought by Amazon. But literally, I didn't have a distributor when I got Whole Foods. I was delivering out of the back of my van Oh, so you got a van at this point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was delivering out of the back of there and our commissary was very close to, it's very central to all the places. And so, but at the same time, I still was not buying boxes. Like a lot of people go. One thing I noticed of the people who didn't last in the commissaries very long because their businesses did not sustain sales mm-hmm. was people always go out and they buy things they think they're going to need and how they think it's going to be done instead of using what they have first. And so a lot of times people will go, a lady, she had a little catering company or not catering. She was making like baby food or something. But the, what she got alone from somewhere and she first thing she bought was a, a car. I was like, oh, that seems like a bad idea, you know? And she lasted maybe six months. Other people go and they buy all the nicest stuff, all the nicest packaging, all the nicest boxes, all the stuff that actually doesn't make you any money. And for us, I mean, I didn't even buy boxes. I reused boxes for packing my deliveries in probably for like two years or more because I'm like, boxes are expensive. They're like 50 cents (laughs) to a dollar at the volumes I could buy. That's a lot to me. And I was always trying to spend as little money as possible, except for in my actual ingredients. But when it came to packaging and all the other elements, gloves or whatever I was using, I was basically trying to get it for free if I possibly could. Okay, so Spud at the time was one of my customers and we had a small agreement where they had another company called Mainland Milk and they would deliver. So they became my kind of my first distributor in a sense. They would deliver because they were delivering you know, fresh juices to some local natural chains and they would deliver my stuff to those natural chains for me for only $5 a drop. Oh, wow. Five bucks, which Holy. was amazing. Yeah. And so I was there basically two days a week dropping off my little boxes of stuff and with the invoice for these other places. And they always went through because they had their grocery business as well. So many boxes that were basically untouched of other people's products, you know, cauliflower, lemon juice, whatever it was inside their box container. And so I would grab the best boxes out of there that were basically untouched. I love it. I would take them back with me and then I would use those and just put Brenham Kitchen or whatever on the outside. And I did that for a really long time, like a long time. (laughs) And most people would just, they wouldn't do that. But I think this is where being kind of without money, I guess, for a really long time, I learned how to still go on with my life without ever lacking anything, I guess. Um, A lot of times when people, when you're poor or however you want to call it, they either just don't 
do things and just keep dreaming of how they can do something and they only work within their means. But I always had a knack for finding how to make things work and still getting to do all the things I wanted to do, yeah. but basically with no money at all by reusing or, or finding something. It sounds to me like there's this underlying belief that I can do it, I can make it happen. And then the question becomes, okay, how can I? As opposed to, I don't have the money, so I can't and giving up. Yeah, exactly. Because I guess I had all that experience through with, first of all, with myself, I trusting myself and knowing myself very well. Secondly, I always had this belief too that everything you need is here. It's can you have the awareness to see it? And it might not always look how you think it's going to look. So be open to how it may appear. I mean, that sounds kind of like a weird rhyme. I don't no, know how no, I did that. No, that is, no, <laughs> Melissa, I, I live by that. And that's why I encourage people. Too many people just set goals when they can see how they can create it, how it'll manifest. But that's, to me, that's a little bit more of a to-do list. When you set a big goal, something that you'd love to have, do, or be, you're trading your life for this, for whatever way you're spending your day. So make it a big dream and stay focused on that end result. Because just like you said, you don't know how it's going to show up. You think it might be there because you need to turn left here. And the universe is going, no, here, go over here. It's over right. So it's not like a straight line trajectory from where I start to where I end up, but we need to keep our mind focused on that end result because some of the things that happen, and you tell me if you've experienced this, some of the things that happen appear to be negative in that moment. We judge them as something bad or not good, but it turns out that's exactly what needed to happen in order for us to take the next step. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. I think it also runs into who you are, right? What mm -hmm. are you willing to do or who are, you know, how are you willing to step outside of who you are, your comfort zone or whichever in order. And what are you willing to do? Like literally, I didn't have a car when I was delivering to Donald's. That was in New Westminster. So I packed up my reusable bags and I took the bus and the streetcar. And these were like 50 pounds. Like these were so heavy. I, yeah. At the end, when I got there, I was like, that was dumb. But, <laughs> you know, like that's what I was willing to do to get the job done. And I think that's one of the character traits of myself personally that have made this so possible for me is that I don't shy away from hard work. And when there's no other way to get there, then you just put one foot in front of the other. And sometimes that means quite literally, and you take it there yourself. Yes. You jumped and on so the bus and made that delivery. I did. And so, and they're one of our greatest customers and we have a really great relationship with them to this day, just because of how much interaction we had and kind of what I was willing to put in the effort that I was willing to put into. I had a flash of an interview I did with a group of young guys, all under 18, ponchos, tacos, pop-up taco stand at Richmond Market. Very similar. They needed to get a an iPad for some stuff that they were doing. One of the guys had to jump on the bus and go out. They found it on a Facebook Marketplace to buy it, right? That's yeah. Yeah. Got to be on the fly. You got to be willing to just, yeah, you know. As opposed to buying that brand new one that you don't really need. Yeah, exactly. At the moment. What was, and, and I want you to tell me about one of the, the first orders that you landed, like the most memorable one, one of the first wholesale orders, or was it specifically wholesale foods where it was, oh my God, this is real now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess Whole Foods was a pretty big deal for sure. I guess we had grown so organically but also quickly you know okay. we got up to 60 stores and I still didn't have a distributor I was still delivering it basically myself out of the little van or Ford Focus wagon how many years was that after you first went into that first store that you grew it to 60 oh that was probably about in a year or 18 months or okay. or so like pretty quick and because the thrill I'm also kind of adrenaline junkie I used to do a lot of fast sports and cliff jumping. And, you know, I just love that, you know, that feeling. And so I was, when something, you know, you're getting a positive response and so you just keep pushing that button, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, and so, yeah, I was just out there every day, kind of like after deliveries or when I wasn't produced production, like I was still also, mind you, doing everything myself. I didn't even really hire, I hired maybe one employee. I had only one and we were making a lot of stuff and hand stickering labels, hand filling, mixing, all Labeling, that stuff. everything. That was all you. 
yeah, so I was basically doing all of that. And then I do deliveries one day a week or whichever. And then I would be out there handing off samples, packs, you know, product and a little card and some little tasting things to new potential new retailers all along. And I would say that that thrill was sort of the thing that kind of kept driving. And then we got Save on Foods. I guess Save on Foods was a pretty big deal for us. Yeah, because, you know, they have a lot of locations and it is more like a mass grocery store, conventional grocery Mm -hmm. store. So to be in a store like that really did feel like, well, I'm in a real product now. We've arrived. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But of course, there's lots of challenges with that as well in that it's a totally different ecosystem. It's a total different chain of command when, you know, addressing category managers and trying to get new products in or supporting products as well. It's just not as fast moving, I would say. So that was the number, a big, huge learning is that you've got kind of three tiers of being nimble. First is being kind of owner operated grocery stores where you can literally roll in there, could talk to the guy who owns it and you can say, Hey, do you want this in your store? Then they say, yes. Then you bring it the next day. Right. And there you go. It's on the shelf. And then you got sort of your second tier where it's sort of, there is a head office element, but they are still pretty nimble and accessible. Yeah. And that you can, you know, nature's fair is a great example of that and that you can talk with a category manager. You know, there's obviously handbooks and rules for doing things because as you grow your company, you have to put those in place, but there's for unique scenarios or say you quickly want to do a a deal here and you want to have a special element to it. They can make that work and you can have a really great, unique experience for the shopper and drive a lot of sales. And so there's that. And then there's the third tier, which basically it's not nimble at all. It's like going into the fog (laughs) and you talk to someone one time and you may not ever see or know them again, even though you're sending out emails or you're trying to call or you leave messages, or even if they say hello to you at trade shows, it's still a fog, you know, you, yeah. they won't return your calls. They don't return your emails. You don't know if anything's working, if they like you, or if they're thinking about delisting your product, like you don't know anything. And so then you might hire a broker who you think is going to know more, but they still don't know anything either. And you become at the mercy of that environment. And I think also with that, there's so many conventional or even mass grocery chains there's a lot of people trying to go in that direction, of course, because, you know, there's just so many of them, you know, 150 or 100, 200 stores, maybe Save On Foods has, right? But you might only get, you know, two or three products in that store, which is a lot, say, um, but your velocities, you're going to have to work so hard to increase the velocity there because you're not going to be able to demo at all the stores. You're not going to be able to, you know, you're mm. just going to be spread pretty thin and they're always going to give their attention mostly to the Saputos of the world or to the huge crafts of the world who have maybe throughout the store, they have 500 products in each section. And of course they spend a lot in trade spend and they get a lot of dollars Mm -hmm. for them. And even though the mass stores are all jumping on sort of this local buy local thing, you're important to them sort of, but truly they don't make a lot of money off you. Even if you are number one in your category, but you only have like two or three um, products Products, in the store. So Yeah. Sometimes you can make just from a vendor or like a supplier's perspective, you can make just as much money by focusing on, you know, a seven chain store and just putting in a little bit more effort. You can make close to the same amount of money or a little bit under, but, and you, there's not that fear of getting delisted at any moment or like shuffling around. And and like, for me, one thing I've learned is that that is definitely uh, something that kind of keeps you up at night or it's an added stressor mm-hmm. that doesn't necessarily have to be there. And I would say to people who are getting into grocery or CPG in particular to appreciate and really relish in those smaller community stores and the ability you have to affect change so quickly mm. in those stores right? because there's peace of mind associated with that that actually is valuable as you start to grow your company and there's just some things you can't control and it, it kind of, you know, it adds a stress to you that. Sure. Is it worth it? I don't know. <laughs> what, what's CPG? Consumer packaged goods. Yes, yes, yes. So would your margins be better with that chain of seven stores than it would with a Safeway or not necessarily? 
Yeah, it, not necessarily. It kind of, once you get into larger chains, unless you have huge volumes, you could go direct. So with save on, we could go direct. And therefore, you'd be, your margins would be pretty good still because you'd be leaving out the distributor margin. Oh, I see. But there's some safety in having a distributor as well that you pay for, whether that be pay, you know, get AR, like getting paid on time and consistently and fees and other chargebacks and just okay. things that happen there. So it's really know your margins or know what you can afford right off top. And then just, you just sort of have to stick with it mm-hmm. and be okay with whatever and always factor in distribution being between 26 and 33%. That's if you have to hire a distributor. Right. And most times you will, because I would also say that people are not that resilient and a lot of people don't, aren't willing to do certain hard things for a long time and deliveries and not getting a distributor and managing the inventory and, you know, getting all the little AR, you know, collecting can be troublesome for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, if you can manage to do it for long, you'll become more of a pull where people want you because you have accrued value and then you can have some negotiation power with distribution or with certain things. So, it, I mean, there's always a trade off. Mm-hmm. Well, I appreciate whoever is doing your copywriting like this from your website. We never try to bullshit your taste buds or fool your brain with cheap, empty ingredients doused in fake flavoring and coloring. We're not out to trick you into thinking you're eating cheese. This is not how we roll. Is that your writing or someone you hired? (laughs) That's me. So the odd time that I am allowed to say something because I I do speak like that, come from a very small town in Ontario. My mom was pretty no bullshit. And I have a very plain way of direct way of talking. And so occasionally, yeah, the group lets me use my actual voice, but sometimes it's it has to be slightly refined, I would say. But <laughs> they're like, well, so you can't say that. <laughs> or yeah, exactly. I was like, I, I can't necessarily do customer feedback, negative feedback things myself anymore because I get so emotional about it and they're like, you cannot send that. <laughs> but I would say in essence that little blurb truly is from my heart mm-hmm. exactly why we do what we do. And you know, you you take the time to source the right ingredients like you're doing for your company for for spread them. When did you hire your first person? What did they do? They helped me sort of sticker lids and they helped me fill fill the containers because once we bought a little machine to do that, I hand scooped it for far too long, I will admit. <laughs> I finally got a little filling machine and so you couldn't really do it on your own. So I hired him to help put the tubs in the machine and push the button. And then we put the lids on after. And then eventually, I think after that, I hired. So I guess that was year two or three. And then I hired another person to help me mix it so that I could not be mixing all the time and focus a little bit more on growing the business. And I guess in a way, I would say that people who want to scale and grow a business and they're very business minded about what they're doing, I would say I'm pretty unique in that. I wasn't business minded. I was actually doing it for the ex- human experience of this whole thing. Like I probably did it wrong for that. If you're looking for personal development, I'm doing it right. If you're looking for how to scale and grow a business, I'm probably not the best person to ask in the short term, but probably I think so in the long term I am. I'm just going to take a little bit longer. And while I know there's been those those challenges and sleepless nights, it's also been a lot of fun journey along the way in those eight years. So yeah, maybe somebody could have accomplished what you did in in four years, but look at all the other benefits that you've done by letting it grow more or less organically. Oh, huge. And I would even say that it's interesting because we did see a big cull of products in the last year or so uh, after COVID and just kind of like people putting a lot of money in something, having an idea, a theory of how it would all play out and then it not working Mm. and going bankrupt or, you know, leaving the sector and just because they were never making money. So like we've literally been profitable since the very first day that we started this and we've kept that mindset throughout. And also it is a long game. A lot of times people want 
you know, they want to be rich overnight and it just isn't. And there's a lot of value in actually understanding the market. And I would say one thing I am obsessed with is customers and how people use the product and why they love it. And I talk with people all the time about that. And I make sure that everything goes through that filter. And I think that is really what's going to have the longevity of the, of the product yeah. through the ups and downs and of the economy or, you know, dips are on trend and then they're not and plant-based is on trend and then it's not. And then there'll be a new thing uh, that's on trend and, and being able to weather having the foundation mm-hmm. and the vision to weather whatever trends come through because we're just a good product. That's right. That foundation is solid. Well, what are revenues earnings looking like now out of your 20,000 square foot state-of-the-art facility? I think we're going to be able to double that, but it it's going to be through exporting mostly. Going to the U.S. is in a controlled way as well is like where we're going to see most of our growth because, you know, as a nine-year-old company in a particular category, unless we start, you know, making a nut, dried nut product or, you know, diversifying what we make, there isn't a lot of room to grow, I wouldn't say here in Canada. And so that's our next big thing is going to the U.S. Now there, we've been saying this for like two or three years now, to be honest. And there's been some, and we've even gone to some trade shows and, and done some things, but. Can I ask you how many stores you've got in Canada now? Oh, I think it's over 2,000. Wow. 2,000 or so. That's yeah, fabulous. It's quite a lot. So you haven't stepped into the U.S. market yet? No. So we're kind of finally actually making the entry to do so. We have submitted to quite a few grocery chains out there. Not too many because I have a very particular strategy. So there's two types of companies really in this packaged good. There's the ones that stay small and local-ish or whichever and turn it into a sort of a family business. Well, I guess there's three kinds. And then there's the ones that go and get, you know, heaps of venture capital. They They usually come from, they either worked in the marketing or something of a CPG, a larger company like Nielsen or, or not Nielsen, Nestle or, or something along those lines or Kraft. Uh, and they get a lot of board and they kind of just get all this money and then they kind of just get market share, market share, market share. Yeah. And then there's sort of like companies like mine, which is sort of like, who's that really famous guy? Anyway, he didn't end up getting any venture capital and he sold his company for $1.2 billion. It was a bar, I believe, a cliff bar. Yes. Oh, really? And so there's, <laughs> there are a few companies like that where even sort of like Nature's Path, where they've kind of gotten very big and it's still more of a family business. Mm-hmm. And I kind of have a feeling that maybe that's the road that mine is going in. Not that I'm going to sell it for $1.2 billion, That's crazy talk. I'm going to play that clip back to you, Melissa, in the years <laughs> when you actually do that. <laughs> yeah, that would be amazing. No, I would cry. I would cry with like just of a like weird emotion but yeah that, that I think that feels like which way the universe is pushing me because every time I've sort of thought about potentially getting investment or being like I'm too tired for making all these decisions all the time or when you get down on yourself because you made a decision that either financially hurt you or time management wise hurt you or felt like it put you back the universe will throw something in front of me that's like you're on the right path just doing what you're doing kind of thing because as of today, this is still your company, the CEO. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So uh, what are your, uh, say, revenues or earnings these days? Oh, um, well, we're still at around $3 million. We're at $3 million is where we're at today. And we're hoping to get to $6 million by, you know, the next 18 months or so with our U.S. export. Awesome. And you built that 20,000 square foot facility with that growth in mind. Like you've got room to grow with that now. Oh, yes, certainly. Definitely. Yes, we have so much room. We're just waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Create the vacuum. It'll fill up. Yeah, yeah. If you build it, it will come. Yeah. <laughs> if you could go back to the startup days, what advice would you give yourself? Like, what would you whisper in the ear of 2015, Melissa? Trust yourself. Don't ever think that you're not the right person for the job. Don't ever think that somebody can add more value than you can that you are valuable and what you're doing is 
important and to have fun. You know, don't be so hard on yourself and don't be so competitive in that way that is through the lens of you're not valuable. Being competitive is obviously fun and is part of it all, Mm -hmm. but do it through the more positive lens of just trying to be your personal best Mm -hmm. and, you know, show, you know, live your, your life through this, this experience and don't necessarily put, um, yeah, don't compare, don't compare yourself. Compete, but don't compare. Yeah. For those of you listening who are not driving and you're in a safe space, go back and rewind that a little bit, close your eyes and really let those words sink in like she's speaking directly to you. Well, what's the best way for our listeners to connect with you, Melissa? Oh, um, me personally, of course, LinkedIn is always a great place. You can find me at Melissa Mills uh, there. Um, you can reach out to email, of course, Melissa at Spreadham Kitchen. We also have an Instagram, which is Spreadham underscore kitchen and a TikTok. If you want to see some funny videos of me showing some behind the scenes stuff, oh, fun. Um, which is also under Spreadham Kitchen. Great. Yeah, I'd say those are the best places. I'll make sure those links are in the show notes. Thank you so much, Melissa, for sharing your story, your journey from startup to 20,000 square foot facility and uh, 3 million plus revenues. And thank you so much for being today's Side Hustle Hero. Well, thanks for having me. It was a delight to speak with you. Thank you. You heard Melissa talk about in the early days of her company, she didn't have the luxury of owning a car. She delivered by bicycle and she even lugged 50 pound bags of her dips on the bus and the streetcar to deliver them to her client. Would you have done the same? What are you willing to do to ensure the success of your side hustle? It doesn't matter what industry you're in or what your profession is. There are going to be times when growing your business is tough and you'll want to quit or you'll avoid doing what deep in your heart you know needs to be done, but it's uncomfortable for you to do. You may have heard a version of this quote. If you do what is easy, life will be hard. But if you're willing to do what is hard, life will eventually be easy. Meaning, if you do what's easy and blame others, blame the government, give up your power, life will be hard. But if you're willing to take ownership of your life and your circumstances and do the tough stuff, you will grow as a person. Life will become easier and you will reap the rewards. Well, that's a wrap for today. You'll find links to the websites we mentioned and Melissa's contact on our website, sidehustlehero.com. If you enjoyed this episode, let me know you're listening and tell me how this podcast is helping you. What areas could we do better? You can tag me or send a DM on Instagram at Joan Possibly. Thanks for listening and hustle on.